See you, Space Cowboy. Hey kiddos, thanks so much for joining me for episode 20 of Chronicles in Collecting, where we're going to take a look at the Soul of Poppy Nika Swordfish 2 from Cowboy Bebop. Before we get into the figure, I thought I'd do a little discussion on Cowboy Bebop itself, non-spoiler, as well as the Soli Papa Nika line, because this is the first figure I am opening from it. So let's start with Cowboy Bebop. Cowboy Bebop is a 1998 anime series. It went for 26 episodes and then had a movie, um, I believe that takes place in between episodes 22 and 23. And for a long time, Cowboy Bebop was, you know, the anime. That was the anime that everybody watched to get into anime. If you wanted to get your friends into anime, you showed them Cowboy Bebop. They, you know, they aired it on TV all the time. Um, you know, it was just really unlike anything that had, you know, come before with all of its different influences, both Western uh, and Japanese and, you know, kind of all over the world. Um, you know, I, I don't want to get too much into spoilers, but sort of the basic plot is that there is a crew on a spaceship called the Bebop, and they are uh, bounty hunters. Kind of start off with Spike, who is the main character, and Jet, who's sort of like his, you know, best friend, you know, um, who's like a little older than him. Uh, they, meet, they meet a few new people, um, you know, kind of expand their crew and kind of get into various, uh, you know, misadventures. Eventually they sort of get... Uh, kind of drawn back into their past and um, kind of get involved in some gangs and some drug war stuff and um, kind of the plot, you know, goes from there. You know, obviously, I'm probably not doing an amazing job of selling the show just on that plot description, but it's really, um, you know, it's really about the, the, the character development and, you know, how the characters can't, you know, really escape their past and, all, you know, they all have these crazy, you know, tragic pasts, and, you know, the animation is cool, the the show is just fun, um, it's got an amazing soundtrack, you know, one of the best soundtracks, um, you know, probably of all time in anime, and I think what's also really interesting about the show is that kind of both the English dub and the Japanese dub are, are kind of amazing, so no matter sort of what your preference is, you're going to get, you know, um, an excellent, you know, experience. Uh, definitely highly recommend, um, you know, watching it. I know there's at least a Blu-ray set, it may be streaming somewhere. Um, I guess also, which I think is kind of how this figure sort of came to be, uh, there's going to be a live action adaptation that I think Netflix is in the process of developing. I think it's uh, filming, may have gotten delayed, um, you know, over the craziness of, of the past year and a half, um, but that should be coming out soon. Anyway, I would really, really, really recommend checking Cowboy Bebop out. Um, you know, I think, again, it's one of these shows you could watch the first few episodes and you'll totally just get sucked into it. And I think the first few episodes will be a good litmus test for, um, you know, whether or not you, you do enjoy the show, but you, you definitely will. Another thing that's kind of interesting about the show is that it's sort of, um, you know, is in inspired by a kind of famous anime called Lupin the Third. I wasn't really familiar with that show when I watched Cowboy Bebop, so I didn't kind of notice the similarities until, you know, kind of much later on. But um, it's not that the plot is similar or anything like that. It's just sort of some of the characters, the character archetypes, a little bit maybe of the feel of the show and the interactions between the characters. Um, but, you know, Jet is kind of similar to, sorry, Spike is sort of similar to Lupin, at least visually for sure. Um, Jet and Jiren, Goemon and Vicious. Um, and I, I think maybe you could make a few arguments as to who Fujiko might be similar to, but uh, let's just say Faye for now, um, you know, just to avoid... Uh, spoilers. I think what's also kind of interesting is that the um, Swordfish 2 is actually somewhat possibly inspired um, by one of the ships that's used in one of the Loop on the Third movies, uh, Castle of Cagliostro, which is sort of very famously directed by Hayao Miyazaki, kind of one of the most famous anime uh, directors of all time. Um, that I don't think that's ever been necessarily 100% established, but if you kind of visually look at it, um, you can kind of tell, you know, that at least, you know, seems to have, have inspired it. And also, um, you know, the team that worked on Cowboy Bebop has mentioned that they, they were 
um, influenced by other, you know, Hayao Miyazaki works. So it's just sort of interesting to see where they may have pulled some, you know, some, some inspiration from. But definitely check out uh, Cowboy Bebop. No idea what the live action show is going to be like, but I'll, you know, I'll definitely give it a fair shake, or at least I'll try to give it a fair shake. Um, also kind of want to mention the Soloi Papi Nika. This is the first figure that I'm opening up from that line def on the channel both um, and, you know, uh, outside of the channel. So I did a little bit of reading because I wasn't quite sure about the line and what the name of it was. I, I kind of knew it had to do something with like an old company, but I wasn't quite sure um, all the history. But basically, uh, Poppy, and I'm, I may be mispronouncing that, I'm, I've never actually heard the word um, spoken before, but it's basically an, an old company that was um, kind of created by Bandai. And they actually create, and Poppy actually created the uh, Chogokin line, obviously. And if you're familiar with my other videos, you know that I, you know, love the Chogokin line and open up, you know, tons of tons of figures from it. Um, and they kind of started. I think one of the things that they did was that they made sort of anime-based figures out of diecast. You know, diecast was used, you know, kind of like in the late '70s, early '80s, you know, for vehicles. Um, you know, cars and toys like that in Japan, but it wasn't used for kind of these anime licensed properties. So they kind of took sort of some of that high end materials and combined it with, you know, a lot of people's favorite characters, um, you know, and, and it was kind of a runaway success. It seems like over time that the Poppy kind of figures just sort of lost popularity and they were eventually sort of reabsorbed into Bandai. Um, and I believe in 1987 was sort of when the, um, Poppy line was discontinued. Now, Poppy Nika uh, is actually a, a combination of obviously Poppy, which is the company name, and then Nika, which I believe is some some sort of Japanese abbreviation for a kind of like diecast car. And actually, one of the figures that really um, kind of got the line going was a common writer. Uh, cycle. So, you know, kind of Poppy Nika was, you know, they, they kind of combined, you know, the two, the, the name of the company with the kind of class of figure that was selling really well to come up with the solo of Poppy Nika. Um, and the Poppy Nika name sort of was no longer used after 1987. At some point, Bandai revived it, um, and now it's, you know, the soul of Poppy Nika line. There's not a lot of releases in that line. I think there's like six right now. There's the, um, the ship from Mazinger, the uh, Piler. There is the um, Kaneda's bike from Akira, uh, which is really cool, and I'm waiting to get in the mail to do for a future uh, open uh, opening. There's the Common Rider cycle, you know, kind of paying tribute to to its origins. Um, there's the Swordfish, which is five. There's a second Pilder, so that makes the PX one through five, and then there's like another kind of special one, which is a uh, space battleship Yamato, which eventually became part of the Chogokan line, Soul of Chogokan line proper. Uh, anyway, just thought that was kind of an interesting um, side story about Poppy Nika. So this figure came out actually in November of 2009, and it retailed for about 8,800 yen, so 80, 85 dollars. Um, and I think that the Netflix series was originally supposed to come out a little earlier than it did, um, you know, as of when this video is being filmed, that has still not come out. Um, so sort of because of that, they decided to re-release the figure. Um, they re-released it. Um, it came out in last year, July of 2019. It retailed for the same price, 8,800 yen. I paid, I believe, uh, 80 bucks for it. You could definitely still find it in like the 80 to 100 range. Um, and I've seen it on sale for as low as $40, you know, unfortunately since I bought it. But anyway, I'm not quite sure what to expect from this line. Um, obviously the first thing I'm opening, but it looks like it might be cool. And another thing that's actually kind of interesting about the Poppy Nickel line is, um, so Soul of Chogokin GX100 actually is like this giant figure and it has these like little miniature figures that's like stored in the, the bigger figure. And they and Bandai is actually branding those little figures as Poppy Nika figures. So that's kind of just like a cool sort of shout out to the history of Chogokin in the GX100 Soul of Chogokin. All right, let's actually get to the figure, which is uh, I'm sure what everybody wants to see and not me yapping about old Japanese toy lines. This could be a fast one. I don't, like I said, I don't really know what kind of accessories, although if I can't get the box open, it might be less fast than I thought. Um, you know, I don't really know what to kind of expect from this as far as accessories and, and all that jazz. Can't get this open. Let's try the 
other side. Okay. People have better luck. Better luck on this side. This is the first figure that I've really had trouble unboxing. Usually, usually I make it at least to the posing before I, before I can't do it. First for everything. All right, so, um, you know, not, not all that much here. We have the figure, there's a little cockpit, but there is a stand, and I do love a good custom stand. So let's, uh, let's take a look at that and see what we could do here. So there's a little booklet here. I'm actually kind of interested what's in the booklet because it doesn't seem like there's all that much here, but let's see what secrets the, uh, the booklet holds. I'm really having trouble today. I can't get the box open. I can't get the booklet open. Okay, so it seems like it's kind of like a, a little bit of a, um, you know, just sort of a recap of the story. There's some pictures of the figures. Um, obviously it's in, you know, Japanese, so not really gonna do much good. There's some cool blueprints uh, of the swordfish, which is cool. I should, I should mention that the um, Cowboy Bebop, so the Bebop is sort of like the main ship that everybody is sort of hangs on, that's like their home base. And then the swordfish is Spike, the main characters. It's sort of like his individual, um, you know, ship that, that he uses. And it actually did work its way into at least one of the Super Robot Wars games. So Bandai is at least sort of like pseudo acknowledging it uh, as a Super Robot show, which it certainly isn't. Um, it's also kind of a funny figure to be opening um, just in general because when Cowboy Bebop was originally sort of green-lighted, the purpose of it was to sell spaceships and Bandai wanted it to sort of be a vehicle, um, mind the pun, for selling more vehicles. Uh, but then it wound up that the the team that worked on it just went, it went so off the rails that they're like, no, this is definitely not gonna create any figures that we could sell. And then it sort of went um, sort of into limbo for a little bit and then Bandai uh, visual picked it up and they didn't have to kind of worry about selling toys but it is kind of funny that in the end they did get some some figures out so it looks like there's kind of a few things that the figure can do which is sort of what the instruction booklet is uh, getting into but let's uh, unbox this let's throw it on the stand and let's see if we can't uh, figure out some fun stuff to do with it okay perfect so do you have a stand does have um does have the low, you know, all, all the info on it. Like when I picked it up, I was like, I looked over here, nothing. I looked over here, nothing. I looked over here, nothing. I was like, is there just a blank stand in here? That's like super disappointing. Uh, but fortunately it is not. What's cool about the figure is um, you got this cockpit with sort of like a teeny tiny uh, little figure of Spike in there. Can't kind of see it. The glare is unfortunately making it kind of hard to see, but you have to take my word on it. Um, but the figure does have sort of a cool, few cool um, features. So I guess one of the most basic is you can open up uh, the little figure there, put in the cockpit. And, oh, yeah, there you go. And you can close it. It's pretty straightforward. You got this here on the back. You can close these, uh, which I believe is its. It's like air brake, so you can do that. Get a little Pac-Man action in there. Um, it's got these kind of, it has these like landing wheels on the bottom, um, you know, kind of like a plane would have. So you could do that. And also with those, you can um, fold the wings up. I don't know why you would want to do that. Maybe it happened one time in the show. It's, it's been quite a while since I've seen it, so I certainly don't remember, um, you know, every pose that that the uh, swordfish had. Um, and that's pretty much about it. It's got these, uh, it's got a few of these extra landing gear parts if you wanna not um, pose it on the stand, but why would you not wanna pose something on a stand when it comes with a custom base? I mean, that's, that's just ridiculous. Um, at least judging by the book, it shouldn't be too hard. So let me just move this out of the way. It shouldn't be too hard to get this guy on the stand. Let's see here. It's just like one little peg. Yep. We can uh, throw this on the rotating stand, and I can uh, 
just give some final thoughts. You know, there's not really a lot to this figure. You know, sort of what you see is what you get. Um, if you are particularly interested in having the wings fold or the air brakes, you know, then this is great. Um, you know, I think it looks, I think it looks nice just sort of sitting there on the stand. It doesn't have like a super premium feel. It feels mostly plasticky. There might be some die cast in there somewhere, um, but uh, it's not apparently obvious. You know, at $80, this doesn't feel like an $80 figure. Like I said, I've seen it for sale for like 40 bucks. Um, I think for 40, this is pretty nice. You know, if you like the Swordfish 2, this is a nice version of it to, you know, have on your shelf. But I don't think this is like a must go out um, and buy figure, you know, unless you're a really big Cowboy Bebop fan or you kind of, you know, like I said, maybe you want to recreate your team from Super Robot Wars or just want to have something that's, you know, a little bit different, um, you know, on, on your shelf. So yeah, that's, um, that's about it for the for the Swordfish 2. I would highly, highly, highly recommend checking out Cowboy Bebop. At least, you know, the first, few, you know, at least the first few episodes just to, you know, get a feel for it. Um, you know, kind of get a feel for, you know, just sort of the ambiance of the show, the characters, the character interactions, and the awesome soundtrack. Anyway, thanks so much for checking out this video. Um, new videos go up every Wednesday, and please join me for our next video where we are going to take a look at the MSN 042 Nightingale, as well as do a little bit of discussion of Mobile Suit Gundam Bell Torchica's children. Anyway, thanks so much and keep collecting.